I was watching a behind the scenes documentary that featured a few big movies like Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Jurassic Park, Terminator 2, uh, and so forth. Uh, it narrated a story about having to innovate to create better movies using new camera systems, new rigs, modeling, stop motion techniques, and so forth. The, what I found most interesting was when there was a transition period to digital filmmaking, there was such a abrasion, like a resistance to go digital. And that struck a nerve with me because here's experts in the field for inventing ways to make movie magic happen. And they were very abrasive to change, especially when it comes to digital. Now, this happened like way back in the night in the 80s, early 90s. And we can kind of see where that transition happened, like with Jurassic Park, um, The Mummy and all those uh, other movies. And it, it really got me thinking because when it comes to aviation and maintenance, especially, we're still having those same abrasions when it comes to digital. Uh, this may sound contradictory because why wouldn't airplanes and such not want to be digital? But this is kind of like another reason why we're talk going into this because it, it doesn't seem like it should be a problem, especially because you want digital stuff. You want things to be more interactive. You want things to be more analytical, see more, do more, lighter and stuff like that. Store more data. Yes. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> now, do you think though, do you think, you know, like you said, there's the, there's always resistance to change no matter what you got going on. But I feel like we've been in the digital age for quite some time. So is the resistance because there's still an older generation out there in the workforce? Or do you think it's because of cost of transitioning from paper to, uh, to digital? And I'll give you an example, sort of <clears throat> not really paper to to digital, but it, it might as well be some archaic technology moving to digital. And in some uh, Citation aircraft, especially the older model Encores, uh, Excels, and XLSs, uh, every month you have to load the navigational charts um, into the aircraft. And I can tell you on many of the aircraft, I would have to go buy online or find a oh my gosh what was the uh giant electronic stores oh um, uh, like circuit city <laughs> yeah but there's another another one out there there's still one in texas i remember because that's the only place oh, i could like, actually find these floppy disks oh nobody like remembers what a floppy disk is <laughs> so <laughs> like i just special yeah dude i had to specialty order a floppy disk card reader essentially that I could plug into my laptop so I could download the charts <clears throat> onto a floppy disk so then that I could go and load it in the aircraft and you would have to do one floppy disk at a time and it never failed. You would always get to the second to last or last floppy disk. You're at 98% and you get a corrupted or floppy disk unreadable and you would have to go find a whole new set of floppy disks, download it all again. Try to, I remember one day I went through four sets of floppy disks. There's about nine, nine to ten floppy disks a piece, mind you, for all the nav charts for one month. <clears throat> and I went through four different sets one night till I got one that finally loaded the whole thing. And I was like, this is madness. I always hated that job. It was very simple, but I always hated it because you're sitting there just staring at it like, don't you fail me, you piece of crap. <laughs> and I remember uh, calling uh, maintenance control and said, hey, you know, nav charts are loaded. Uh, I've submitted all the forms, you know, just review them and give me a thumbs up on the release for flight. And I'll lock the door and throw the sticker on it. The, uh, you know, anti anti tamper sticker on the door. Uh, and I was like, but I got to I got to ask you, I was like, why in today's day and age are we still using floppy disks to load these charts? And and the answer they gave me was cost. It was at the cheapest $10,000 to upgrade from a floppy disk in that aircraft to a, uh, to a USB option. Wow. <laughs> and I was like, 
okay, $10,000, but they also had a fleet of uh, 17 aircraft that needed it. So, you know, take 17 times 10,000. It's a pretty big chunk of change. Yeah. I'm not okay. saying you'd have to do it all at once, but, but like many places we've all been in the, uh, the, uh, the answer always is, well, you made it work. Just make it work again. Yes, <laughs> exactly that. <laughs> exactly you know, so, that. so I wonder if the hindrance to move to digital is more cost driven than it is uh, resistance to want uh, of people to want to use the digital systems or learn a digital system. Right, right. And I believe you're right in that regard, especially because, because of the cost, right? And we can see this now with uh, certain people upgrading their uh, personally owned aircraft or company owned aircraft from analog to full glass cockpits. Uh, we've had multiple episodes on that. I'm like the pain of having to do that or especially to retrofit new stuff into older fuselages, older planes. Like sometimes like it's not specifically meant for you to do that. And for you to make that happen, you got to cut stuff away. You got to add stuff in. It saves weight in some areas, but it, it adds weight in others. It, it's a whole lot of engineering craziness. And where are we at now with some of these planes? They kind of sort of do some of that stuff already. Uh, we see it now like in aircraft Wi-Fi. Uh, you can use you can use your cell phone on the plane. Like because there was always this moniker like if you use your cell phone on a plane, you're going to wreck the system and crash it things of that nature. Nowadays, we're in the time and age where that's almost non-existent now. Um, so that's interesting. And I haven't really paid too close attention to that because since I've kind of stopped going on the road as much, I haven't, I haven't, you know, for work, I haven't really paid too close attention to the airlines and all that. But just last weekend, uh, you know, Kool-Aid and I traveled to visit her family uh, in Mexico, but we flew on a Mexican airline and they said laptops and iPads had to be turned off, but your cell phone did not have to be turned off. And I thought that's interesting. I thought all electronics had to be turned off. Right. <laughs> uh, so you're right. We were moving beyond even, you know, the technology is moving beyond where you know, aircraft signals aren't being uh, destroyed by your signal that's being output by your cell phone or whatever else. Although apparently a laptop can still do that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's confusing <laughs> to really me as well. In, in right. More. So like we're, we're getting in that direction, but there's other areas and the most of it or a good chunk of it is maintenance related. Um, like the maintenance logs and records are lagging. Your uh, si um, sign off and inspection systems are lagging. There's talks of it happening now, especially with when it comes to like predictive maintenance systems. And we've had an episode on that as well. Like it starts talking about what the benefits are from moving from analog physical paperwork stuff to digital, fully integrated, contained into an iPad style maintenance. And by all means, this sounds fantastic, right? If you're if you're very tech savvy now, and I'm sure the future of aviation is going to be all of your maintenance manuals in literally the palm of your hand or like in a pair of sunglasses that you can project holograms through a screen or something like that. Like, a, like, a, what's it? A back to the future or something like that. <laughs> but um, Well, actually, isn't somebody out there developing those right now for maintenance where you, I mean, <clears throat> on your safety goggles, will have a HUD and you, you'd be able to, pull up even maintenance manuals on the HUD of your safety glasses. Right. Yes. I think uh, matter of fact, that was mentioned by the Larson's uh, motorsport or yeah, oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. It was mentioned by them. And that's like, that blew me away when that was, that was possible. It's like, eventually it's going to be like Iron Man where like you just have like this little tennis ball thing and then it projects like a Jarvis or something and it tells you everything about the plane. The good part about that is it gives you like real time response. Like, um, or should I say real-time actionable info? Because a lot of times, especially with some systems now, like there's a lag in how soon or how late the, the information comes through. Uh, so, and some of it, it all depends on the server or depends on how soon or how late you 
pull the data and stuff like that. We're going into some really nerdy stuff, but it's the good part about it is the it, the infrastructure of it. Once it's working, it's super fast, and you can store a lot of stuff. Uh, some upwards, uh, whatever is larger than a terabyte. I think it's exabyte or something like that. But imagine like how much like a two terabyte hard drive can hold. Shit, I got like ten years of my life in into a hard drive, and I'm barely scratching the surface on this thing. Now imagine like say something as big as exabytes and stuff like that you can have all those years of of uh, information of data and records and stuff just being stored into basically the palm of somebody's hand. And you can access it at any point in time. That's the good part. <laughs> right? That's the good part. Um, there's also less moving parts. So there's less chances of things breaking. There's uh, less neat because something you can store so much in such a small space. Now you got more air quote real estate to do stuff with. Right. Now that's the nice side of things. Uh, as MVP has alluded to earlier in the episode, like the cost to make this happen. I believe that's where we run into one of the major issues because yeah, we have all this huge library of logs and records and manuals and history. Then we're going to take all of that and convert it into basically a hard drive or a server room of hard drives. That takes a lot of time. <laughs> and then I don't know the full cost overrun of how much that would, how, how much that would go for. But I would imagine, like, uh, depending on how much history you're trying to cram into it, it, it take you upwards of, I don't know, like a month. Uh, depending on how many people are working on it, you got to pay for those too. And then if your current setup is not equipped to handle that kind of an upgrade, because that's a big one too. Uh, we've mentioned that as well. Like, we had, we've had to put new stuff in old aircraft. Sometimes it's just... As much as we want to, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's just not economical in some some cases or the benefits kind of. The benefits of, of the upgraded system don't don't outweigh the cost of the asset you're putting them in. Sometimes in some cases, the cost of the uh, upgraded electronic system is worth more than the value of the aircraft. Yes. Although some may argue that you know the value is determ is uh, determined by the owner, right? If it's got sentimental value to them because it was their grandfather's aircraft, then to them they don't they don't mind upgrading the electronics. But <clears throat> you know, like you you mentioned uh, digital you know maintenance records and all that. Um, I've I've used probably four different systems now for uh, electronic uh, maintenance records. And I, I got to tell you, nothing is foolproof. Each is dependent upon the success of each has been dependent upon the person inputting the data. Yes. You're still, even with all this digitation, uh, is that right? Digitation. Did I say that right? Uh, digitation. Digitate, digit, Digi digitization. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's it. <laughs> I, think I just made up a Pokemon name. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, um, you know, for as good as as they are, they're only as smart as the people using it. Uh, for example, the one system we have now, we just had a, a situation today where you know we went back through the archives, uh, looking. Uh, well, basically, them saying, you know, hey. Uh, we need your guys' buy off on these fluid samples to, to be good. And you're like, well, some of these samples failed. We're awaiting the retest. You know, we haven't seen the results of the retest. And then we kind of look further and we're like, hey, there's actually the job package for us to sign hasn't even been loaded. And then the finger pointing starts going around. Well, who's supposed to load that? So the people who maintain that system say, well, that's not our responsibility. But then if you look in the historical archives, you see that it's been in fact that department who's loaded every job package. But then they're, you know, they made a good point. They're like, well, but we're not the ones actually working on it. The maintenance group should actually be the ones loading that. And we're kind of like, all right, I agree with that. You guys are just the custodians of it. But, but like, even again, for as good as they are, everything should be automated. 
uh, it still has flaws, and that's because of the human human factor. Um, yes. But the one excellent thing about digi- digitized forms, am I, am I saying that right again, everybody? Uh, mm-hmm. Digitized digital forms um, is that they they track keystrokes. So if anybody goes in there and tries to do some shady stuff or try to delete something or an erroneous write-up or whatever, try to hide mistakes, um, I mean, they might be successful in removing it, but you can always figure out who did what where because and see exactly what they did because it, it tracks each keystroke you do in the system so it's good for uh investigative purposes or you know uh trying to figure out the history of something yes or said, hey i saw that right up in there what happened to it uh i don't know we, ne- we never loaded it and you're going that's funny i swear i saw it in there an hour ago so you start digging through the forms like oh it was there and you guys removed it why you know right Yes, and that's another big one too, and that, that that's a good uh, pro of having stuff that's uh, digital. Uh, you made a made a very great point about the human factor of it all, because even with forms, regular hard copy forms, you're having to decipher what that person wrote or what that person meant, and it can be very challenging. Uh, I'll say, like uh, sometimes uh, when you leave it up to a forms, it's kind of like at the whim of the person. If they're inputting it right, if they even choose to write it up that way. Now we say we switch to digital there. You, there's ways to program it, code it, or some programs actually have this feature where you can't progress any, uh, any further until you've completed a certain percentage of the form, like cause, uh, malfunction or defect code, stuff like that. And, but again, like as MVP said, like it's still subject to human error because sometimes you might have wrote it wrong or you might have input it into the system wrong or the, there's a glitch in the system for whatever reason it's not accepting your sign off or your write-up so you have to like get a rig some kind of way to bypass the safety feature in some of these programs and it's not perfect because uh, just like uh, teaching a new person how to do forms you got to teach this computer how to take it to and especially when it comes with computers now where it's not like you can just say, hey, you're doing it wrong. Figure your life out. You have to like move things around, switch some software up, put some stuff in. We're going and then we're again, we're going into some heavy uh, nerd stuff like uh, for a, yeah, bit, a lot of, of ones and zeros. Yes. <laughs> and uh, one other thing I uh, want to mention, too, and you kind of touched base on it was the issue with digital, which I believe a lot of people are abrasive to as well, is when the system crashes right <laughs> and we've we've talked about this numerous times where um if all of your records and your logs and your your work histories are in a system and it crashes what the hell do we do now <laughs> right then some in some places they're not equipped to do that like they're full digital full cloud computing full whatever there's many industries galore about that where they don't double document stuff and for good reason why they don't but when a server like that crashes it's almost like a full stop like everyone stop what you're doing freeze in place until the system comes back up it's like jurassic park again <laughs> going back to that movie yeah. reference <laughs> oh man i'll never forget the day you <laughs> did that in that meeting and blew everyone's minds <laughs> that was fun but it, but it's true like uh, nothing works everything's going wild um no one knows what to do because they because everything is dependent on the server or the system or the program to work. And especially if you're in this transition phase from analog to digital, you, you may not have a contingency plan in the event something like this happens. Now, if you are going from analog to digital, you may just so happen to have physical forms to kind of back yourself up. But if uh, we've seen this happen uh, plenty of times where we're in this area where they they're make trying to transition to full digital. And so they started getting rid of forms and a lot of the individuals who knew how to use forms don't remember how to do it or they've moved on to greener pastures. And now the, there's a knowledge gap of how to do it manually. So then they were just like, full stop. What do we do? We can't do shit, and, and 
thankfully for certain uh, places, it's that's not the case because <laughs> that would really suck. But uh, for areas like that, that's another issue with going full digital is like you got if you don't have a backup plan to this or if you don't in, the, in a way save your game uh, in multiple places, then you're screwed as far as your history is concerned. Right. And now, that's exactly where I was going to jump in at with it was the you learn that your your system's only as good as its backups. Yes. <clears throat> and uh, if the system crash and, crash and you have no backup data, you've got no historical records for that that aircraft. That that doesn't fly with the FAA. You know, there's mm-hmm. got to be some form of backup. And you say, okay, well, I have a digital backup. Okay, well, again, are you, is that data being backed up? Are you verifying that? You know, otherwise, some people would like just they'll periodically print the forms and three hole punch them and stuff them into a binder it gets dusty on a shelf. Right. Yeah. But at least there's something, uh, you know, ran into a situation again in my own area of work recently. We uh, we had an I.T. professional and they were new. Um, you know, a, a job came up on the on the call board and they said, oh, I'm going to. I'm going to go do that. Now they weren't trained to operate on that system yet being new, but they also weren't ignorant to the task either as, as to why, you know, they got the job in the first place. So they had some skill set. but anyhow, with like with any unfamiliar system, they were doing their best. They were good intentions, you know, uh, inadvertently deleted data and we're going, well, poop. Okay, that's fine. Uh, let's just pump the brakes for 30 minutes to an hour here till we can uh, pull the backups up and uh, get everything reloaded. And uh, we'll be good to go. Uh, come to find out, there were no backups. Uh, there were at one time, but I guess they ran out of storage space and nobody chose to say anything that they were out of storage space. So they were just overriding old data. Uh, oh my like, God. Well, <laughs> you can't overwrite the old data because now we don't have any historical archives. <laughs> our, our historicals are as deep as the last overwrite. Um, like, oh my God, what's happening? <laughs> so, so it's just, you know, so for all the smart program in the world, uh, it's still, it still crippled us for a short time. Um, fortunately, you know, we were, uh, we have some, very technical savvy people that could decode a bunch of different stuff and recover from recover eons of data from a otherwise broke system. But what a, what a, what a nightmare, right? So yes. I guess worse, you know, you could say, okay, if we had paper backups, like, all right, well, worst case scenario, someone's now going to spend a lot of time hand jamming all this data back into the digital format. And then back it up from there. But at least you had something to go off of. Yes. Best case scenario, stuff got deleted. You go, why? And you're like, I was just trying to help out and get things done. Be proactive. Appreciate your effort. Maybe maybe ask somebody next time. Slap them on the back of the hand. Everybody goes back to work. You reload your historical data and you're off and running. Yes. <laughs> I'm just going to blow my mind right now. Like zero zero history whatsoever and then no no paper backups to begin with like yeah that that must have sucked and, and overriding the historical data so your historical data is i let's just say you know they were re- overriding once a week so i only have a, a week's worth of history on that asset wow <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> oh no <laughs> Now, now for those of who are unversed, right? Espe- depending on the organization you're with, especially if it falls under certain FAA regulations, like you must maintain at least a year's worth of data or year's worth of history for each individual aircraft, for each action, for each operation, stuff like that. At least a year. Like, like uh, some will probably want to go as far back as two years, but at minimum one year. And to have that all crunched down to one week, oh, there would be so many red flags popping up at that moment, which is why we freak out about stuff like that. And this kind of brings me to another great point uh, to kind of round a lot of this out 
is the dependence on technology, which I believe is the the human side of it where where a lot of people are having issues is because there's a lot of uh air quote old school people who feel like some of the newer mechanics coming up are too reliant on technology and there's there's truth to this as we've mentioned in some episodes where uh some some of the newer mechanics or newer technicians that get very reliant on the system whether it be the maintenance server or the aircraft itself like telling them what is wrong or it's almost i wouldn't say idiot proof but it's very easy to isolate the issue like a light goes off uh uh, a, a thing blinks on the screen, something like that, where it says like something is wrong, or it throws out like a like a check engine light code, something like that, and that kind of takes away from the the troubleshooting aspect of things, where like you actually have to chase it down, figure out why it's wrong, and some individuals, especially these air quote old school people that I talk about, like they become very good of understanding the system or understanding the aircraft, like. We, we've made jokes about some individuals. They could hear a plane just pass by and they can tell you 100% what's wrong with the plane. Like they could just smell the, the fuel trail that it leaves behind and they can say, oh, like it's burning too hot or the engine is leaking oil or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, but again, like the dependence on technology bit, like that kind of, we kind of mentioned this already with the system crashing, but it's also with like, when it comes to like, just, hard skills like especially with like um troubleshooting is a big one or another one is using manuals uh using your fault isolation trees stuff like that like we've uh we slowly walked away from using those hard skills of having to problem solve what the aircraft's going on we just kind of left it up to the plane to tell us what is wrong and in an in a way that's good because now we've advanced the system so well where like for something to be completely off the wall wrong and it's not in the isolation tree or it's not in some kind of updated manual and i say updated very loosely (laughs) yeah Um, we increase our mission readiness times right you say well if i can already have it tell me what's wrong and order its own part before it lands uh man i can i can already be on standby and while we're doing it, while we're doing a plane uh, uh, unload and reload of passengers, I can swap out this and ops check it real quick. But I also kind of think, you know, it's good for those, those kind of things, but bad because we as maintainers are kind of losing that, that, well, uh, that skill of troubleshooting. I'm trying, I was trying to think of a better way to say it. it's almost like being a shoe cobbler, right? Yes, it's it's a dying trade. Well, sort of feels like, sort of feels like, and being really good at troubleshooting is almost a dying breed. Um, yes. There's not a lot of people who are who are great at it anymore. Now, not to say that you wouldn't have to troubleshoot your electronic system, but nobody. It feels to me, anyways, at least where I work at, nobody is super intimate with the system to be able to know what's going on just by a sound or just by watching you know a number fluctuation on the on the screen right Um, but i also think that's tied in with you know parts i mean aircraft parts are very expensive don't get me wrong but there's an abundance of parts now you know I, i think and so it's it goes okay well a plane sitting on the ground isn't making any money so we'd rather spend some money and swap this part out and then send the affected component back to the back shop where the, where, you know, where the maintainers can, can work on it in their, in their leisure. Um, it's more economical for us to shotgun parts at it. Boom. Did that fix it? Yep. Hey, we're off and running, you know? Yep. <laughs> uh, I'm not losing, I'm not having to cancel a, a revenue flight because uh six has to go troubleshoot the left engine, uh, uh, oil consumption issue, you know? Yeah. And that, that is very uh, on the money on that one. Um, and, and parts in itself that that's, 
And I think that's another thing going that since you mentioned parts is like we've gotten very accustomed of just, as you said, just shotgunning, just throwing parts at it, hoping that that's going to fix it. Now, I have seen some individuals who how we're very frugal about having to replace things like they they want to really get down into the grit of what's making this part tick or what's making it work. And um, it's gotten more complicated, I would say. Because not not it's not just valves and timing and springs anymore or uh, baffles. Now it's all just like these little electrons that zoom across the circuit board kind of thing. So the troubleshooting of it is a little harder, but at the same time, like you still gotta have that mindset of knowing how, where, and when to troubleshoot this. Like, what things do I need to turn on and off? How do I find the root cause and chase this down? Kind of kind of troubleshooting mindset. That's what we mean. Like. That kind of stuff. Yeah, and I think sweet. most of us would agree. Like that is what a feeling, man. There's, there's, that's a pretty good high when something breaks and you've been troubleshooting it for a couple hours, and all of a sudden you just find the smoking gun, and you're like, "Oh my god, oh my god!" Finally, I did it. I did it. Me, I did it. I found this. I found the problem, and I fixed it. Yeah. Um, and uh, but you know that that feeling sort of gets taken away we find our our thrills by hey how long was that how long was that air you know aircraft on the ground for well it landed at 11 and we had it back up in the in the air by 11 30 wow and you know that's crazy um pretty good now somebody out there might be going wow it took you 30 minutes to turn it well okay yeah maybe if it's a smaller aircraft but let's say oh it only took us 30 minutes to turn it and it was a 787 with that was a full flight like wow, <laughs> we we kicked ass, and I I changed a component out and fixed and all that within that thirty minute window, and we didn't lose any time. Like yeah, that's where you find it now. You're like okay, I, I'm I gotta I'm, I gotta do the buzzer beater, you know? Yep, <laughs> I do my half court hail mary. Oh yeah, and I love those feelings. If you if you've ever been a mechanic or if you've ever experienced that, you know what we're talking about. Like it, it, there's this sense of like fulfillment when you see it uh, go up and away and actually come back down safely. Um, so like what, uh, what have we learned from this stuff? Right. Uh, from, from the areas that we've been in digital is in full swing, like uh, certain areas like it's been digital, right. Or they've made that transition. Like as soon as they came up with the idea and for the places that haven't, I mean, I'm sorry, but, yeah, you got to embrace the suck. It's going to happen. It's inevitable. <laughs> but at the same time, as MVP has said, like just because it's transitioning to digital, it doesn't mean it's all encompassing or it's, uh, it's, uh, it's all ending. Like we still have to practice, uh, these hard skills that, uh, like troubleshooting, for instance, and we have to practice like contingencies for the, in the event that these things break because they can and will especially with the amount of uh, turnover we were going to push these things through, especially when, especially in the commercial realm, because flights come and go every 30 minutes. And depending on how many planes you have in your fleet, you'll cycle through all your up planes real fast. <laughs> and if uh, we're not planning for any contingencies, like say the system crashes or the onboard troubleshooting computer crashes, now we're stuck. <laughs> And we got to figure out a way to get keep that moving because uh, as passengers, we've all seen this. Even so much as a 15-minute delay can offset so much in, in the long run. Like you land, you take off 15 minutes late. That means you land 30 minutes late, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it all compounds. We don't want that. And any any maintainer out there will tell you we don't want that. We want you flying up and away and out of our hair on time and on track <laughs> or on track and on time. <laughs> yeah. If I got a, if I got a bird sitting in the hangar, it better be for uh, a phase maintenance or a, or a TCTO of some type. I don't want it to be for no piddly crap that broke, you know, in the right. interim. Yep. Uh, I'd rather have, uh, I'd rather have a bird down that's scheduled to be down versus the unscheduled maintenance. Yep, exactly right. And digital is great, but it is limited. It's limited uh, to the person or the user, say. And the, uh, we can't really dispel this fear, but the way digital is going now, it's 
it's looking unlikely that it's going to replace the thinking human. So a lot of uh, the air quote old timers out there, like you're still relatively safe. <laughs> that they're still going to need your hard skill, wisdom and knowledge to help run the line. Like I highly doubt, at least in my mind anyway. Now, this is not like speaking authority here, but in my mind, I don't think that the thinking human is going to be removed from the equation anytime soon. And if they are, it's going to be like a very minuscule task that didn't need human interaction in the first place. Like, yes or no, go or no go. Like, okay, like it's, it may not be a critical task. And I, and I still find that hard to believe there's going to be some kind of AI program out there that's going to make those critical decisions and replace the thinking human, at least in my mind again. <laughs> that goes back to maybe our our uh, RTD2 styled friend. Yeah. <laughs> maintenance buddy. On the, yeah. Giving us some beep boop beeps of encouragement while we're out there on the line. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, final thoughts on this MVP. Uh, well, you know, we're not escaping digital. And in fact, at this point, I kind of don't want to escape digital. It's just... It's so much uh, user more user friendly and, and handy to have essentially everything kind of a, on one computer, right? I don't have ten different books. I can have my you know electronic maintenance manual, my TO uh, or maintenance manual. You know, um, uh, what did I say before? Electronic uh, logbook. I meant. Yeah, but then um, you know your maintenance manual. Plus, you can have drawings up you can have everything kind of on a different screen pulled up at one time at one spot and and uh do a quick search to find it without having to comb through the table of contents you know so um you know it's good to be digitized but but again like i said before it's only as good as the people inputting the data so just because everything's uh digital doesn't mean you get to be a slack jaw on your paperwork Yes, um, you start to put forth the same effort and type in, type in the good job. Because I still see, even in uh, in electronic log books, you get in there, you know, remove panel. Which which panel, and why <laughs> did you remove it? Yep, you know, I just remove panel. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> now, now we are kind of triggering a lot of individuals because, especially in. Uh, in certain areas where the end all be all is the AMP license holder or the AMP certificate holder, that might just be it. Like remove panel. Cool. Removed panel. Right now, again, this is all based on whatever your maintenance manuals tell you. So, I mean, by all means, follow that. But as MVP have said, like uh, just because it's, it's mathematically statistically sound, it doesn't mean that it's practical and vice versa. Like it, it depends on the, the input of the user. That means you. So, um, uh, closing thought on it and is, uh, just because it's making things more convenient doesn't mean that, uh, as MVP said, like you, you can slack on your skill set because that's what we pay you to do is to, is for your skill set and knowledge base. So don't rely too heavily on the technology and keep on practicing those, those, um, hard skills because there's going to be a time when the computer will run out of batteries or the computer, the server will crash and we're left to you. And if your answer is like, well, I need to plug in to figure out what's going on. That's not going to jive. <laughs> yeah. Say we get into a, another pandemic and there's a part shortage. Guess yeah. what you're going to be doing on the line. You're going to be troubleshooting that component because there's no replacements in the storage room. Yep. So, uh, and supply. So, uh, Pitter patter with your multimeter. <laughs> exactly. But let us know what you think. Like, uh, do you feel like digital is not moving fast enough? Do you think it's moving too fast? Uh, how do you feel about digital po- possibly maybe replacing some jobs? If there, if there is jobs that have already been actively replaced by them, let us know your thoughts. Uh, hit us up on all the various social medias in our website. Hit us up on our email. Tell us your thoughts and we'll, we'll be happy to answer them. We'll be happy to share them. And if we get enough response, maybe we'll make a whole nother episode just on that. On that note, everyone, thanks again for listening. And we will see you again next time. Bye, everybody. We would like to take this time to thank our patrons for supporting our show and allowing us to make episodes, maintain our gear, 
and create merch for all of our listeners. With special thanks to Erica Lamont, Chris Hawkins, Eric Shaw, Dan Schubert, Ryan Frushauer, Kyle Keir, Mike Sherwood, Caleb Stockhill, and Jennifer Brofer. Thank you all so much for your support and patronage. If you like our show, please support us on Patreon. You'll receive awesome perks like access to our private Discord, discounts and early access to our merch, first glimpse of our comics and other projects, and so much more. You can further support us and show off your prowess as an aircraft specialist by visiting our shop at cancelformaintenance.com. If you like classy or rugged watches, visit our affiliate Rockwell Time at rockwelltime.com. Use the code CX, the number 4, MX, to save 10% off your total order. If you have suggestions for the show or you'd like to be a guest on the show, send us a line on our contact us section at cancelformaintenance.com and we'll do what we can to get both your ideas and yourself on the show. Please support us on social media like Facebook at Cancel for Maintenance, Instagram at C-A-N-X for Maintenance Podcast, or Twitter at C-X-M-X Podcast. Please check out our new comic series on the Tapas app. Like, share, subscribe, and comment on our comics. Let us know what you think. Thank you all so much for your support and listenership, and we will catch you all next time.